Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you George Raft, French O'Tone, and Lynn Barry in Each Dawn I Die. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. This Hollywood of ours is more than a place. It's an idea. An idea that embraces all America. We plead no special interest and ask no special consideration. We are democracy in action. To provide entertainment for the whole people and by the whole people. Take the case of the Lux Radio Theater tonight. Our stars are George Raft, Francho Tone, and Lynn Barry. They hail from New York City... Niagara Falls, and Roanoke, Virginia. And the rest of our cast represent 12 more cities, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And the families from which they come are rich and poor and in between. The play that brings them all together is the Warner Brothers' success, Each Dawn I Die. It's the story of a man sent to prison for a crime he did not commit, and of the girl and the gangster who give him courage when he needs it most. We were encouraged this week by a letter from a lady in Ohio, which adds another chapter to the adventures of Lux Toilet Soap in faraway lands. It seems that the lady has a daughter, and the daughter has a fiancé, who's a soldier somewhere in North Africa. One day, he developed a desire for oranges and approached an Arab who had some on display, knowing that it's more fun to barter for something than just to buy it. He'd come prepared with a cake of Lux Toilet Soap which he'd received in a Christmas box. After bargaining for a few minutes, the soldier unwrapped the soap and let the Arab smell it. The Arab immediately offered three times as many oranges as he had before, and the exchange was made. Our thanks to the lady for the information. I predict that if that soldier ever meets the Arab after he's tried Lux Toilet Soap, he'll have orange juice for the whole regiment. It's curtain time now for each dawn I die. Starring George Raft as Stacy, Francho Tone as Ross, and Lynn Barry as Joyce. A hilltop on the outskirts of a great city. On the side of the road, a car stands facing down the grade. To this car come two shadowy figures, supporting between them the unconscious form of a young man. Uh, he's heavy as lead. Get him in behind the wheel, quick. Okay. Lift his legs here a little. There. You got that bottle of liquor? Yeah. Douse his clothes with it and throw the bottle in the back. Uh, it's a waste of good booze. Hurry up. Okay, okay. Now release the brake and get out. Here we go. Up off. With an unconscious man at the wheel, the car glides downward. At the bottom of the grade, a traffic light blinks red at a crossroad. The car hurtles toward it, faster and faster, then swerves madly into the cross traffic. You, Frank Ross, having been found guilty of the crime of manslaughter, it is now my duty to pronounce sentence. There can be no excuse for leniency in your case, as you should be well aware. Since you have, as reporter for the Daily Record, often denounced drunken driving as the most ghastly of crimes, a view with which the court agrees entirely. And when such drunkenness results in the slaughter of two young innocent citizens... I didn't kill those people. I wasn't drunk. I wasn't even driving that car. When the accident occurred, you were behind the wheel. The court has found that to be sufficient evidence in spite of the fact... But I tell you, I was framed. I was framed by that eminent public servant, District Attorney Hanley, and his equally eminent and equally crooked assistant, Howard Grace. Your Honor, I protest. Framed? Because they knew I could show them up for the dirty, grafting rats they are. Silent! Silent! Frank Ross, you are hereby sentenced to the maximum penalty the law provides. Imprisonment in the state penitentiary at Rocky Point for five to twenty years. Court adjourned. All right, Ross. This way. Five to twenty years. Frank. Oh, 
Frank. Did you hear him, Joyce? Five to twenty years. For something I didn't do. Darling, it's not over yet. We're going to fight this. We'll be working for you every minute. We'll get you out, darling. Twenty years. I'll write to you. I'll write every day. And you write, too. Please, darling. Sure. Sure, sure. All right. Come on, Ross. We've got a train to make. Lunch, Ross? No. You ought to eat, son. It's on the state, you know. I don't eat with a carload of ten cent crooks. I'd rather be hungry. Who's that ten cent crook? I am, Monahan. Well, Stacy. So they're taking you back to school, huh? Yeah, for a while. I'm getting a degree this time. Oh, who's your friend, Monahan? Name's Frank Ross. Ross? Oh, yeah, I know him. A reporter, isn't he? One of those wise guys that's always writing about how crooks are yellow. And crime don't pay. I guess the D.A. didn't like that because he knows better. Well, what'd they give you, Mr. Ross? Five to twenty. But I won't be there long. Well, you don't say. Going in and out, just like that. Clever boys, these reporters. Say, write a piece about me when you get out, will you? The name is Stacy. Life sentence. I'd like to see my name in the papers. You'll see it in the obituary column. You don't shut up. Why, you scare me, Sonny. Hey, Monahan, change my seat, will you? He plays too rough. What's the matter, Stacy? Oh, we got a real killer in the crowd, boy. Ran over a couple of kids, so he thinks he's tough. <laughs> well, how tough are you, Sonny? Listen, you. Sit down, Ross. Yeah, come on and show me. Cut it out, or I'll let you have it. Put it. Now get over there, Ross. Sit down. Let him go, Monahan. I'll tear his head off. You shut up, Stacy. What'd you go picking on him for? I don't like reporters any more than I like cops. If a reporter hadn't stuck my tan all over the front page, I wouldn't be here. And now I got all the trouble of crashing out. Don't forget to send us the date. Yeah, and don't bet that I won't. All right, line up over there. Come on, line up. Keep your arms folded. The new arrivals, Warden. Not all new, I see. Hello, Stacy. Hi, Warden. Men, I have much to say to you. Stay on your good behavior and you'll get along a lot better. If you get into trouble in here, you become second or third grade prisoners, according to your offense. More serious offenses are punishable by solitary confinement. Or as we call it here, the hole. I don't recommend it. Hey, Warden, I'd, I'd like to speak to you for a minute. Keep your arms folded. What do you want to say? Well, I'm here on a political frame-up. I didn't... When a man is legally convicted and sent here, we assume that he's guilty. And treat him accordingly. That's all. All right, men. Left turn. This way, men. Where do they take us now, huh? To the cell? No such luck, brother. That jute mill. Hey, Pete. Ten more men here. Okay, I'll, I'll take care of them. Well, if it ain't Stacy again. Couldn't bear to be away from old Pete, huh? What's he got this time? A hundred and ninety-nine years. Well, now, that's real generous of the judge, huh, Stacy? And just to show you what a nice welcome home you're going to get, guess who's in here doing the book, too? Your old friend, Lippy Julian. Julian? In here? Yeah, I thought that'd get a rise out of you. Hey, Lippy, come over here. You want me? Yeah. You know this fella? Yeah. I guess so. He ought to know me. I gave him that limp the time he tried to double-cross me in the Danamora break. I know you. And you ain't gonna forget me. Now, boys, don't fight on Mr. Stacy's first day back. Stacy, over to that breaker and get to work. You go with him. Wait a minute. What's your name? Ross. Say sir when you dress an officer. And fold your arms, do you hear? Yes, sir. Go on over there and join Stacy at the breaker. The rest of you get over there and help stack them phase. Stacy, hey, fellas, look who's here. Hello, Muggs. Oh, it's just a visit. Oh, this is Frank Ross, boys, a gentleman of the press. He's a killer, so hang on to your hair. Oh, sorry we ain't got no typewriters on this machine, uh, nor no yellow ink, Mr. Ross. Huh. Well, what do I do? Why, you flap your ears and wish you was a swallow. Come over here. Hey, Gosky. Gee, it's swell to see you, Stacy. Never mind that now. When did Limpy come in? Oh, a month ago. Well, what's he in for? Murder, second degree. He's doing life. Look, Gosky. You know it's Limpy or me, don't you? Yep. Well, 
Well, it ain't going to be me. How much time do you get? A tray. I'm out in two months. Oh, good. Keep your nose clean so there's no slipper. I might need you on the outside. Okay. But listen, don't turn your back on Limpy. He's got a knife stashed, and he'll use it. Don't worry. I'll watch him. Tell me up, you guys. Casey! Jowski! What were you talking about? Come on, what were you talking about? Ain't there a rule against talking in this jug? Yeah, and you broke it. Limpy hurt. Come here, Limpy. What'd they say? I couldn't hear them, but they was talking. Why, you low down crawling. Get back! Break it up, Casey! Look out there! Casey, he's reaching for a knife! Grab that guy! I'll kill him! Get back! Look out, Casey! Now get back to your machines, all of you. Go on! Come here, Ross. That was your trip, Limpy, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Well, he had a knife. I don't like to see anybody get cut up. You're learning fast, ain't you, Mug? Look, I'm no Mug. And I don't like being called one. Oh, you don't like it, huh? Get over to the captain of the yard. You too, Stacy. We'll see if a month in third grade will take some of that guff out of you. Go on, speed it. I guess I owe you something for tripping Olympic. It's a nice job. Forget it. Oh, your first day in this hokey pokey and you're tangled with Pete. Trip up his prize rat and you lose your privileges for a month. Oh, you got the makings of a swell con. Not me. I'm not staying long enough. Yeah? Well, until you do leave us, let me give you a little advice. You know anything about Limpy Julian? Mm, he's just another con to me. Well, remember this if you want to stay healthy. He's a killer. The toughest kind there is, too. The kind who kills a guy because he gets a kick out of it. Yeah? Well, I'll let you worry about Limpy. I got my own troubles. What the... What's that? Don't look now. Is there a knife sticking in the wall about two inches over my head? I'd say about one inch. Yeah? Hmm. Lippy's aim is improving. All right, you guys, keep moving, will you? This is supposed to be an exercise period. Yeah, moving. Well, move faster. You'll be getting fat, Stacy. Yeah. You got a cigarette, Ross? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Well, by the way, uh, whatever happened to that plan of yours for getting out of this place? I hear they turned down your pardon, Ross. Yeah. That gives you a year and a half before you can even ask again. Well, the paper's working on a new angle. If the boys dig up some evidence, I get a new trial. Sure, I knew a guy like you once. Uh, he's waiting for a new trial, too. He waited 30 years. Did he get it? Yeah, they found him guilty again. Oh, hi, Agoski. Hi, Stacy. Hey, listen, I just got ratted on. Well, what about? That can of soda you slipped me this morning. He saw me using it. That means the hole. Who ratted? it? Uh, Limpy and his new pal, Feather. Well, what's wrong about soda? Well, you mix it with salt and damp tobacco powder, and it makes snuff. It's forbidden. You got it on you, Gosky? Yeah, but Pete's looking for me right now, and I can't get rid of it. Slip it to me. To you? Well, Stacy, they'll put you in come the on, hole. Come on, come on. You're going out on parole next week, ain't you? You can't afford to go out of circulation now. I need you on the outside. Slip it quick. And here, keep this knife. I come out. I may want it. You ever been in the hole before, Stacy? Sure. Twice. Been in for 60 days? No. Right here. Nice place. Yeah. You know, a uh, guy's a sucker taking a rap like this for something he didn't do. Yeah. I've seen guys go half nuts in here in 30 days. In 60, they go all the way. Well, that's because they ain't smart. I am. Close the door. Okay, sucker. Hey, fellas. Stacy's out. He's out of the hole. When they let him out? An hour ago. I seen him taking him up to the office. How'd he look, Red? Like a ghost. His eyes was all shut like, like the light hurt him. So he's out. Well, we'll find out pretty soon who wins the blood sweep. You got a bet on a deal? Yeah, plenty. You got a bet, Ross? I don't bet on one guy killing another. That ain't it. Limpy says he'll get Stacy before he's out of the hole 48 hours. But you've got to call the hour. I got two cans of tobacco that says one of them gets it in 12 hours. Look out. Here comes the guard. Lights out in 10 minutes. Hiya, Ross. Hello. Put me in with you. Mine? Why should I? I took that bunk there. I didn't know that was mine. Oh, it's okay. I'll just move your stuff. Wait a second. Leave it alone, I. Hey, what's that? I told you to leave our stuff alone. You got a knife, huh? Yeah, I got a knife. What about it? Nothing, I think. I'll be handy down there. I can't see. Need anything? Soap? Tobacco? Toothpaste? Uh, listen, Ross. I 
Forget about that shiv. What shiv? Never heard the word before. This shiv. The knife. I don't see any shiv. Hey, boss. You're all right. Hello. Hello, Warden. This is Gallagher. Listen, Warden, we've had a killing. In the theater, a killing. We had the men there to see a picture, and all of a sudden, this guy... What? It was Limpy Bullion. Yeah, somebody stuck a knife in it. Hey, hey, Ross. Yeah? Come on down to the end of the yard. I want to speak to you. Okay. Well, what do you want? Listen, hey, do you work for doing you any good? Well, they're trying. You've been here four months. Well, it takes time. Bum rat, wasn't it? I told you that a couple of times. All right. Look, if you could get out, would you be able to pat down the guys who trained you, wouldn't you? Sure, only I'm not out. I'm in. What do you want? Listen, Ross. I didn't kill Lizzie. Sure. All right. Whether you believe it or not. I didn't. I meant to. I was afraid the screws might search me. So I passed the ship on to another guy. He loved Limpy like I did. So Limpy collected. Okay. But that don't make any difference between us. You saw me with that ship, and you thought I did it. I worked for you, and I'd be doing the book in the hole, and you'd probably be caught. Forget it. I'm no right. I don't forget it. You kept your mouth shut. And I owe you plenty for that, and I'm going to pay. Ross, did you ever figure that if I was out, I could find out who framed you and get you sprung? How? I got connections. I can find anything out by putting dough in the right places. Yes, so all we've got to do is get you out. <laughs> That's a cinch, isn't it? Listen, this is no screwy idea. I can get out. If you'll help me. How? Look, you're up for killing some guy in here. You're tried in the courthouse. I'm doing life. 199 years. So no pardon. No parole. I can't crash over these walls in a million years. So the only chance is to get to the courthouse and try it from there. It'd take an army to get you out of that courthouse. A lot of guys have tried it. They tried it alone, and they didn't plan it. Listen, remember Gosky went out a couple of months ago? Well? Uh, we figured this out together. I let someone rat to the warden that I slunk that knife and lifted. I get indicted. Gosky follows the case through the papers and gets me a mouthpiece. He knows the day I'm to be tried. He knows the courtroom. He makes all the arrangements. Where do I come in? You're the only guy I've ever met that gave me a break without putting the bee on me for dough. So now I'm giving you a break. Go to the warden and tell him about me having that knife. I told you I wasn't a rat. Look, I'm asking for this. It's my only chance. I won't do it. You say you didn't kill Limpy. Well, somebody did. And they got to get the right guy. Limpy was killed. Murdered. And that still means something. To oh, me. will you listen? Ross. Frank Ross. Yeah? Get over to the warden's office, Ross. You got a visitor. It's just so terribly. I tried to come up a week ago and the week before that, but I... Well, I couldn't get a pass. Sure, I know. Oh, let me look at you. Frank. Yeah, I, I look great, don't I? Oh, it's so horrible like this, talking through a screen. I, I want to say so much, and I can't. Is there... Is there anything new? Only what I wrote you. You haven't found those guys that put me in the car? Not a trace of them. But we're still working, and a lot of the boys in the AP are working with us. We'll find them, darling. We will. Yeah, I guess so. Oh, Frank, don't give up hope. Please don't. Hope? Huh. There's no hope in this place. Is there, is there anything I can do for you? Is there, Frank? Yeah. Don't come back anymore. Frank. Don't come to see me. I can't stand it. Not like this. It only makes it worse. Darling, please, I've got to come out to... Hands up. You'll have to leave me. <laughs> Yeah, what? Listen, I, I've been thinking. Will there be any shooting down at the courthouse? No. Are you sure? I don't want blood on my hands. Will you give me your word? What it's worth to you? Sure. Okay, Stacy, I'll say it with you. Good. But remember this. After they may figure you in, I'll throw you in the hole. You may have to take a lot of punishment. I don't mind. But don't talk. Once it's done, keep your mouth shut. That's the tough part of this. I know. You are uh, those guys on the paper got any line on who framed you? There's only one lead. You ever hear of Shake Edwards? Yeah, a rat. Well, he was in front of the newspaper office when I came out that night. He was the finger man, I'm sure of it. Shake Edwards. I'll find him. And I'll get you out, remember that. No matter how bad things look. 
So if it takes a long time, I'll get you out. Legally. All you got to do is to go up to the... Tell the warden you saw that knife in my bunk. Well? All right, Stacy. Good luck. So long, fella. Thanks for everything. <laughs> After a brief intermission, we'll hear George Raff, Francho Tone, and Lynn Barry in Act Two of Each Dawn I Die. And now, greetings to Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter. Libby, here's what I guess you'd call a leading question. Do you think a woman can really improve her complexion? Well, I not only think she can, but I think she's foolish not to try, Mr. Kennedy. It's just a matter of determination. Determination and uh, Lux toilet soap, Libby? <laughs> Naturally, Mr. Kennedy. There's an unbeatable combination. But improving your complexion is like exercising to reduce your waistline. You start with a flourish, keep at it a few days, and then... I know, Libby, I know. But as a matter of fact, complexion care really is lots easier. And we women are lucky to have a real beauty soap to help us. Lux soap is that. Pure and mild, truly gentle. Which is why, of course, nine out of ten screen stars use it. Yes, I've heard many a star say she wouldn't be without Lux toilet soap. Screen stars just can't afford to take chances with complexion loveliness. And neither should any woman. Because every woman can be attractive if only her skin is fresh and smooth. Just ask any man if there isn't something irresistible about a lovely complexion. Well, ask me, Libby. I'd say yes. Decidedly yes. Well, screen stars certainly know the appeal of soft, smooth skin. They wouldn't dream of skipping their daily beauty care. Toilette Goddard tells me she uses Lux Toilet Soap every day. Always takes a thorough, active lather facial at bedtime. She smooths lots of the lather well in, rinses thoroughly, and packs with a soft towel to dry. Now, that's a very simple care, but it works. I know that from my own experience. And I feel this so strongly, I want to say it again. The woman with average features can look simply charming if she'll just make the most of her look and give her skin a chance to be fresh and lovely. <laughs> well, now I'll bring my little sermon to a close, Mr. Kennedy, with these words. 30 days of regular Lux toilet soap care is the way to new complexion beauty. There's a tip straight from Hollywood. Right, Libby, and a mighty good one. Lovely ladies everywhere depend on Lux toilet soap, the beauty soap of the stars. And if any one of you ladies hasn't tried this fine white soap yet, why not make a note to get some tomorrow? Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of Each Door and I Die. Starring George Raft as Stacy, Francho Tone as Ross, and Lynn Barry as Joyce. From behind the bleak walls of the state penitentiary, a convict in the know can occasionally smuggle a note to the outside world. Such a note was written by Frank Ross. Passing through a dozen pairs of hands, it finds its way at last to the office of the Daily Record. Watch the Stacy trial. Have reporter, photographer there. Big story. Say nothing to anyone. Destroy this at once. Let me see that note, Joyce. It's Frank's writing, Mr. Mason. Stacy trial. What are you talking about? Is Stacy's case up for appeal? No. The only thing I can think of is a trial in the prison itself. Yeah, but what for? I, I don't know. All right. There's nothing we can do now except wait. If anything breaks, take a camera and get up there yourself. Yes, sir. Who? <laughs> Me on the way through. 
You identify this knife as the one you saw in Stacy's bunk? Yes. Why didn't you tell me about this before? Oh, I didn't want what Limpy got. Why this sudden courage? It isn't courage. I... I want to get out of here. I see. I suppose you figure that if you squeal down Stacy, you get a break from the parole board, is that it? Yes. Yes. I suppose you will. I hope it makes you happy, Ross. You talk like you don't want the guy who murdered Limpy. Sure we want him. And to get these guys, we have to deal with rats. But that doesn't mean we like it. Take him out and get Stacy here. Under guard. Stacy Trial, set for 28. On the 28th day of this month, a notorious gunman and bank robber will stand trial for the murder of a fellow convict. Should the verdict go against him in this trial, the sentence of 199 years will be changed to death. Stacy will finish his life sentence in the electric chair. <laughs> yeah. If I'm still here to sit in it. Mr. Lockhart, are you prepared to sum up for the defense? Not just yet, Your Honor. With the court's permission, I should like to put one more witness on the stand. My client himself, William Stacey. By all standards of practice, this witch seemed to be a foolhardy move. I realize that. I now call William Stacy as witness on his own behalf. William Stacy, take the stand. They call me to the stand. I start walking toward the stand. Only I don't stop. I'll stop walking. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Hey, get back here. Stop in there. The window. I told you. I don't know a thing. You testify against Stacy. Bring him to trial. Your newspaper covers a successful prison break with pictures of the criminal escaping, and you know nothing about it. Well? Nothing to say, Ralph? Nothing. Gallagher, bring Feather Miller in. All right, Feather. This way. Come here, Feather. Yeah, Warden? You know this man? Yeah, he's wrought. Repeat what you told me this morning. Well, I... Uh... Go on, Feather, go on. It was the day he squealed on Stacy. I saw them together in the jute mill, and, well, they were standing behind some bales, and they were speaking. And they shook hands, and the day after that, Ross went into your office, and they squealed on him. You dirty little... Cut it! Well, Ross, still got nothing to say? That's right. Okay. That break you were going to get from the parole board seems to have backfired, Ross. But I'll give you one more chance. You give me the lowdown on Stacy's escape... And tell me who helped him. I'll give you your first grade stripe and put in a word for you, for the board. If you don't talk now, you'll do your 20 years, Ross. Every minute of it. All right, Gallagher, take him to the hole. You haven't got anything on me. I don't know where Stacy went, but I'm glad he made it. I'm in here in a phony rat, and I'm not taking a thing from anybody around here anymore. Rules don't mean a thing. Come on. I'm going to be just as mean and dirty and hard to handle as the worst con in a joint. And I'll flood the first guy, rat or screw, that crosses me. Come on! Stacy, you want me to open it? Wait a minute. Get over there and cover the door. Johnny, you beat it in the bedroom. Right. All right, bud. See who it is. Who is it? It's me, Lockhart. I've got the girl. Lockhart and the girl. Open up. Get in, Lockhart. I brought the girl with me, Stacy. Yeah. Sit down a minute. All right, Gosky. Take the tape off her eyes. Put your head up, kid. Okay, they are. My lawyer said you wanted to see me. Yes, I do. What about? I'm Joyce Temple. I work for the Daily Record. That's no recommendation. I... I was engaged to Frank Roth. Yeah? Well? Stacy, you've got to get him out. What am I supposed to do? Send him a pair of wings? What's the matter with his old pals on the newspaper? They're smart, aren't they? 
They'll help keep him in. Can't they work in reverse? I don't know what you're talking about. Ross would. He said he'd keep his trap shut. But he didn't. He tipped off the paper. So the courtroom was crummy with reporters and photographers waiting for the break. He had to let his paper, though. He's a reporter. Well, being a reporter blew him right into the hole. I hope he rots there. You think he double-crossed you? Well, I think he's like every other wise guy. He had to have a payoff to dummy up. You don't believe that there's anyone, man or woman, that money won't buy, do you? Well, is there? Look at Garsky. Look at Bud. Weasel with the punk cigar. He gets paid just to look out that window. And look at Lockhart. Look at me. I am looking at you. And it's making me sick. What do you mean by that last crack? Now you ought to... Sit down, Garsky. Go on, let him beat me up. That's right in your line, Stacy. Standing by while your gunmen do the dirty work. Now listen. You listen to me. Frank's been up there for five months waiting for you to help him. Five months in the hole while they try to make him talk. Well, he hasn't talked. But you didn't pay him to keep quiet, did you? No. He kept his mouth shut because he trusted you. He thinks you're his friend. He doesn't know you never heard of the kind of loyalty that money can't buy. He doesn't know you're just a dirty, cheap hoodlum who never did one decent thing in all your life. Well, who ever done anything for me? Frank Ross. He's doing it right now in the hole at Rocky Point. I met Ross, I thought he was square. The first on the level guy I ever knew. He is. Then I wasn't so sure. Why did he tell his paper for? Because he couldn't help it. Because it was a great story. Yeah. All they would have needed was a picture of the truck and the driver. It wasn't the picture that sent him to the hole. There was a convict who saw you and Frank talking. His name is Feather Miller. He told the warden. Feather? Are you sure? I got the story last week. A man who just got out. You know what would happen if Frank talked. Garsky's been seen around. If you told him Garsky helped you, they'd place him inside of a week. That's why you've got to help him, because of what he's doing for you. Put the tape on her eyes. Oh, listen, Put I... the tape on her eyes and get her out of here. Come on, kid. All right. There's just one thing. Don't talk, kid. You know what's good for you. Go ahead, Lockhart. Give me your hand, miss. How do you like that dame? Walking in here and shooting a truck. Shut up, Garsky. Huh? And listen... If I ever catch you raising your hand to a dame again, I'll bat your brains in. Well, for the love Shut of... up, I said. Johnny. Yes, I see. There's a guy I want to see. Go out and bring him in here. His name is Shake Edwards. I don't know. Believe me, Stacy, I don't know anything about it. I didn't have anything to do with it, honest, Stacy. I'm waiting, Shake. Who were the guys who stuck Ross in that car? I don't know, I tell you. I, I... Do you want me to refresh your memory? Now talk. Don't, don't stay talk. talk. All right. All right, I'll tell you, Stacy. I'll... Go ahead. There, there was two of them. They put Ross in the car on top of the hill and busted a bottle of booze all over the back. Who were they? One was Charlie Lang. He skipped out to the coast. You'll never find him. And the other guy. Come on. It, it was Feather Miller. He's in Rocky Point. Yeah. That newspaper was making things hot. The DA sent him away on an old rap to keep him out of the way. Like putting him in a safe. That's all I know. You can't blame me, Stacy. That's all I Get know. Get up, rap. Foskey, call Lockhart. Get the boys in. I want to see them. <laughs> Rocky Point. That's not going to help much, Stacy. We can't get at him. What do we do now, Stacy? We get at him. What do you think? Oh, sure. We just take off the Kelly at the prison door and say, please, can I talk to Mr. Feather Miller? It's too hot, Stacy. And supposing we do get the guy, where's the payoff? The payoff. We get Ross out. That's the payoff. Why don't you forget it, Stacy? Yeah, that's what I say. Go fooling around in Rocky Point, we'll get paid off with a slug in the belly. And I ain't taking that to Ross nor nobody. Okay, get out of here. All of you. Go on, beat it. There's not a thing you can do, Stacy, not legally. They'd never let me get near that Miller guy. All right, so why should I suddenly get legal? I've been doing all right the other way. I don't get it. Look, most of the guys in this world are a bunch of heels. You included. Yeah? I always said if I could find one right guy, I'd do anything for him. Well, maybe I got my chance. Huh? I'm going up to Rocky Point. Myself. Listen, Stacy, don't be a fool. It's the only way I can reach Miller. You mean you're going to give yourself up? Yeah. Hmm. You're getting bright. Look, Stacy, I'm your lawyer. But if you pull a stunt like this, I'm through. I don't want anything to do with it. Sure. I told you you were a heel. Listen to me. They'll throw you in for life, Stacy. They'll shove you down in a hole to your rock. I'm warning you. Don't be a sap. 
I broke out of that pen once, and I can do it again. <laughs> they haven't built the jug yet that can hold me. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Just a few minutes, George Raff, Francho Tone, and Lynn Barry will return in Act Three of Each Dawn I Die. And now, I don't think you'll find it hard to guess who this might be. Now I've had an afternoon. Working right up to six, and now I've got to change and get to the canteen by 7.30. Well, that could be any woman anywhere in the United States who's doing a double job right now. Her own, and one for her country. It might be a famous Hollywood star who's just finished her day's work at the studio and is going to be serving sandwiches at the Hollywood Canteen tonight. And whether she lives in Hollywood or Chicago or Cleveland, this busy lady is very likely to say... Oh, I'm glad I'll have time for a good, relaxing, luxe toilet soap bath. Guess I'll treat myself to a nice new cake. And if it happened to be Barbara Stanwyck or Irene Dunn or Marlena Dietrich, for instance, she'd tell you... Here in Hollywood, we always use our complexion soap as a bath soap, too. Lux soap makes a wonderful beauty bath. Busy women everywhere have discovered something. That creamy Lux soap lather seems to float away dust and dirt in the twinkling. Leaves my skin fresh and sweet so that I'm sure of daintiness. Yes, active lather does the trick. It's thorough, yet it's gentle, too. When you step from your Lux toilet soap bath, your skin feels satin smooth, exquisitely fresh. Women say this fragrant, relaxing bath is wonderful as a quick beauty pickup. They enjoy the delicate Lux soap perfume, too. A perfume like the fragrance of many lovely flowers. And here's a thrift tip. Lux toilet soap is hard milled. That means each smooth cake can be used to the last thin sliver. Why not get some of this fragrant white beauty soap tomorrow? Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. I'm going to make a proposition to our stars after the play. But now, here's the third act of Each Dawn I Die. Starring George Raft, Sancho Tone, and Lynn Barry. With a life sentence hanging over him, Stacy walked through the gates at Rocky Point and gave himself up. Stacy's back. Stacy's back. He walked in the front gate like he was going for a stroll. He's a crazy, that Stacy. A life sentence, and he comes back to serve it. In the warden's office, Stacy lounges carelessly in an armchair, a cigarette dangling from his lips. He's very sure of himself, cool and arrogant. Why'd you come back, Stacy? Well, I like it here, and I got lonesome for my friends. I'm afraid you won't see much of them for quite a while. You know what this means, Stacy? Sure, it means the book in the hole, according to the rules. But not for me. I only came back for the weekend. You made it out once, Stacy, but you'll never do it again. Well, we'll see how it works out. Now, do I get that plush line cell in solitary, or don't I? Any time you say. Thanks. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, you still holding Ross in solitary? Yes. Why? Well, I sort of figured you could let him out. Now that I'm back, I mean... Uh, why are you so interested in Ross? Oh, I'm not, but I don't like to see a guy taking punishment for nothing. Did Ross help you make that break? <laughs> You're still kind of sore about that, aren't you? Well, I can't say I blame you. Did Ross help you? I help myself. All right, Stacy. What happens to Ross? I'll let him out of the hole when you go in. Okay, Stacy, I guess you know the way, don't you? Yeah. Looks familiar. What are you doing this time? The warden says the book. But you never can tell. Ross? All right, Ross. Come on. You're out. Huh? You're out. You've got a new tenant for this place. Hiya, Ross. Oh, so they caught up with you. They slammed you right back where you belong, didn't they? Yeah. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad they got you. You hear? Sure. That's all right. Take it easy, kid. Come on, Ross. Inside, Stacy. Okay. Lock it up good and tight. 
I might decide to go for a walk. You mean to say you didn't know Ross? I thought they caught up to him. Caught up to him nothing. He gave his up. But why? What for, Red? You saw him. And they tell you? No, he didn't say a thing. Hey. Yeah? Watch yourself. Pete's looking. Okay. Listen, everything's set. Yeah? What time? Three tomorrow afternoon. Right here in the jute mill? It's the best place. Joe's going to be on the door. At three o'clock, they open it for a couple of bales. Mooch over and stall around until we get them open. There'll be guns inside. How many? I don't know, but enough. Wait a minute. Is this a break? Yeah, it's a break. Didn't you let him in, Red? No. I didn't know whether you wanted him. We want every guy in the mill except Feather. I told you that. We need him. Well, you'll have to get along without me, too. Yeah? Why? Because I think you're nuts. What chance have you got? Suppose you do bust out of the mill. There's still a wall to get over. We'll take care of that when we get to That's it. That's a great plan. Run up against a wall and then figure a way out. Are you with us or not? No, I'm not. Even if you had a chance, I wouldn't be with you. What do you want to do, rot in this place? Well, I'll rot before I see you send every man out there to get a slug in his head. All right, Ross. But I'm warning you. If you know what's good for you, don't talk. What time is it? 30 seconds more. 30 seconds. Suppose the guns are late. They won't be. Now start walking to the door. And keep your eye on Feather Miller. If he makes a He's move... He's safe. He's on top of the machine on an oil engine. That goes the door. That's the bale. The second one. Are the boys moving? Yeah. Where's Pete? Over to the left. All right. Start opening the bale. Yeah. Uh, come on, come on. Tight. I got the rope twisted. Hurry up. Get over here. Screen the bale as much as you can. Here they are. Dale, there's a Tommy gun here. Get it out, quick. Let me up. I'll take that. Hand it over. Hey, look out. Here's Pete. Quick, grab a gun. Hey, you guys. What are you doing around that bale? Get away from that. Get, Get away from that, Pete. Or I'll let you have it. Why, you. All right, Pete. Get out in the hall. Keep moving toward the gate. You guys with guns, take care of the guards. Remember, get every gun you can lay your hands. Come on, you guys. Come on. Oh, listen, man. Don't be fools. You haven't got a chance. Shut up, Ross. They'll blow you to pieces before you get to the main I gate. Said, shut up. Fred, take Ross along with you. If he tries anything funny, put a slug in just came in, Mr. Mason, and breaking the jute mill at Rocky Point. Prison break. Get a hold of Jerry. Tell him to beat it up there. Jerry Phillips, quick. They've got the warden locked in his office. They're holding him as a hostage. Any of them get out yet? No, the state guard's been called. They're surrounding the prison. Hello. Hello, Jerry. Get a car and meet me downstairs. We're going up to Rocky Point. Wait a minute, Joyce. I didn't say you. I'll call you as soon as I get there. Joyce! <laughs> You're crazy, all of you. Put up those guns. Dale, call those men back out of the yard. I'm giving the orders, Warden. You're going to call the main gate and tell them to let us through. You're digging your own graves, you fools. You do as we say, or you're digging yours. Listen, big shot. You saw what a couple of your guards just got. Now give that order and quick or I'll blow your hair all over the ceiling. Go ahead and kill me. You still can't get away with this. All right, Warden. Joe, you know, I'm going down to the yard. If those gates aren't open in ten minutes, knock them off. Yeah, a pleasure. Be seeing you, Warden. Warden. Well, listen, stall for time. They can't win. I'm glad you're not in on this, Ross. You're using your head. I'll make my own break when I'm ready. Stacy! Stacy! Here, over this way. I got the keys, Stacy. What goes, Red? We got the warden. We're holding him in the office. Some picnic, huh? Who's running? Deal. Come on. Is Ross with you? He's in the office, yeah. And listen, I got two guys watching Feather Miller. You said you wanted to see him. Yeah, I do. You got a gun, Red? Yeah. Give it to me. I'll be in the warden's office. Get Feather and bring him in there. How's it going, fellas? Having fun? Stacy, there went down the yard. He's going to stall him off. Where's the warden? Over there. Listen, Stacy, you got brains. Tell these guys they haven't got a chance. We'll take it up later, Ross. I've got some business to take care of. But they got the state guard all over the place. Even if they open their gates now, they'll never... Save ever... it. 
Hiya, Warden. I suppose this break was your idea, Stacy. Oh, no, but as long as it happened, I'd figure I'd play along. Well, you're through. You might as well hand over those guns. Shut up, or we'll finish you right now. You better not, Joe. You'll need him for dickering later on. Get up to that window and see what's happening. The yard's full of soldiers. Hey, what do we do, Stacy? You aren't through yet. You make out. Out where? Out through the back door, where they carry the stiffs. All you got to do is pick the screws off the wall. Get some rope from the twine mill and lamb over. Oh, it's too late for that. Dale's plans didn't cover the back door. No? Oh, too bad I wasn't around to help. They're coming up. They're right down the hall. Close that door. Wait a minute. Let me through. Let me in. Come on in, Red. Here he is, Stacy. Feather. Oh, hello, Feather. How are you? Look, Stacy, I'm not under this. I want to get out of here. Sit Go over there and sit down. Here they come. They'll get us through. What do we do, Stacy? Come on. It's up to you. You know, any prayers don't bother the same. They won't do you any good now. Warden, come here. Well? Sit down and write a note. Tell them we'll release you if they give us a chance to come out alive. My orders in case of riot are to keep firing regardless of the safety of any official or guard. Those orders will stand. Okay. Joe, here. What do you want? Here's a chance to be a hero, Joe. Get out the back and across to Withers in charge of that twine mill. Tell them to cease firing. We surrender. I ain't going. I'll be killed. So what? You'll be knocked off in here, too. No, no, I won't do it. I'll open the door for you. Beat it. No, listen, Stacy. Come on, now. I told you, Stacy. You can't get out there. You. Yeah. It looks like they don't want to play. Hey, what's the matter? You hit? Yeah. How bad? Bad enough, I guess. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Pick him up. Put him on the couch. Okay? No. Don't. No. Don't move me. Isn't there anything I could do? Not a thing. It doesn't make much difference anyway. Hey, wait. Where's that feather guy? You want him, Stacy? Where is he? Feather, come here. Hurry up. I haven't got any time to waste. Funny, uh, an hour ago I had 199 years to do. And now I got no time. Get over here, Feather. Hold him where I can see him. What's the matter, Stacy? Hand me a gun. Oh, oh, oh. Well, Rat, caught up with you at last. I ain't done nothing. Don't shoot me, Stacy. I ain't done anything. I know. I know. Warden, here's a bird wants to sing. About Ross. He gets snappy, Feather. Oh, I don't know what you mean, Stacy. I don't know. That was just a sample, Feather. Off by an inch. The next time I won't miss. Listen, Stacy, I don't know what you're talking about. Come on. Come on. No, don't shoot. Don't. You ready to talk? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Warden, this is a confession. And it's going to spring Ross. So remember it. Okay, Rat. Start singing. Who framed Ross? I did. But I didn't mean to have nobody get killed. How did you frame him? I, I knocked him out and then drove him around for a couple hours. And, and planted the liquor in the car. Yeah. And started the car down the hill and jumped out. Yeah, but I didn't mean anybody get killed. I... Shut up. Heard enough, Warden? Plenty. Okay. Let the rat go. Get up that window. Tell him we surrender. You can go in, Ross. Stacy wants to see you. Thank you. Warden, may I go with him, too? You, Miss Temple? I'd, I'd just like to thank him for what he's done. Very well. Go ahead. Stacy, it's me. Ross. Ross. Yeah. Who's that with you? Your girl, huh? I, I wanted to thank you. Forget it. You, you're going to get out, Ross? In a, a couple of days. That's, that's great. I'm going out, too. My way. Look, you can pull through this if you want to. Try, Stacy. Will you? What for? You know, I'm, I'm glad for one thing, though. Finally met a square guy. So long, fella. Stacy! It's, it's funny. I, I was saying... Just a couple of days ago, I... 
They haven't built the jug yet that can hold me. I... I was right. Wasn't I? Exciting is the word for each dawn I die. And exciting is the word, too, for the performances given by George Raft, Francho Tone, and Lynn Barry. And here they are at the footlights now. Oh, thank you, C.B., and glad to be back with you again. That's good, George, because uh, I have an assignment for all three of you starting tomorrow. So what's the name of the play, C.B.? Now, it isn't a play, Francho. It's a victory garden. Oh, George Raft growing vegetables is something I'd like to see. Well, what's wrong with that, Lynn? I've got a lemon tree in the backyard right now. Now, look, George, if you're a little short of space, I got an idea. You can take care of my gardener. I'll give you half the stuff. Just think of all that good spinach. Spinach? Are you kidding? Well, uh, I'll throw in a few eggs. I got some chickens, too. Oh, well, uh, what's your offer, Lynn? Well, wait till I've got a garden. How do I find out what and when to plant, Mr. DeMille? Well, you, you can write to Victory Gardens, Washington, D.C., or get it from the newspapers or magazines, Lynn. Now, George, I'll make you an offer. You take care of my garden, and you can have all the food you can use at your house, and I'll give you a cow, too. Oh, that's pretty generous, C.B., I accept. What kind of a garden have you? Well, let's see. There's about 10 acres of corn, about 10 acres of squash, about 10 acres of potato, and there's about 100... Now, wait a minute. The deal is off. <laughs> oh, but I, I, I haven't told you about the carrots and the peas and the beans and the cabbage yet. Nice little garden you have there. Well, it's, it's really a farm, Francho. You eat some of my vegetables at the Paramount Commissary. I'd like to urge everyone who can plant a garden to do so. But it's, it's, uh, let, let's not be grim about it, because it's a lot of fun. There's no reason under the sun why everyone can't solve part of his own food problem in his own backyard and have a good time doing it. Well, if I'm going to plant a garden, I'd better get in an extra supply of Lux toilet soap. I bet it feels better than ever after a day in the garden, and your complexion will certainly need the right care. <laughs> By the look of things, you and Lux Soap have been very happy together, Lynn. Well, what's on the fire for next week, C.B.? Something very unusual, Francho. Because next Monday night, one of Hollywood's newest finds will star in one of our plays before he appears on the American screen. His name is Pierre Aumont. And within a few weeks, You'll hear a great deal about his screen performance in the new Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer picture, Assignment in Brittany. He came to watch the play tonight to see how we do things. So right now, I'd like to have you all meet Mr. Pierre Aumont. Thank you very much, Mr. DeMille. I think you have forgotten the most important thing, however. Huh? Oh, 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 yes, of course, of course. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, next week in the Lux Radio Theater, this fortunate young man is going to play opposite Miss Lana Turner. You see what I mean? <laughs> Before the war, Pierre was one of the big stars on the stage and screen in France. On the day war was declared, he reported to his command in the French tank corps. I'll ask Pierre himself, to tell us the story of what happened to him after that tragic month of June 1940 when France fell to the Nazis. Well, most of my comrades were taken prisoner, but I was lucky enough to escape. I went to Morocco and then to Lisbon, and then I caught a boat to the United States. And when in New York Harbor I saw the Statue of Liberty, life began again for me. Um, three days after, I was signed by Miss Catherine Cornell, and I had the great privilege of appearing with her. And then came Hollywood. I'm sorry our audience couldn't follow your career from the beginning. But suppose we start now by taking a scene from next week's play. Say that, that scene in the uh, police commissioner's office. All right, sir. You ready? Ready. A man called Jean Pelletier is under arrest. In the dim light of the police station, he faces his accusers. They have told you that my name is Jean Pelletier. That is true. 
They have told you I am a criminal. That is true. On March the 14th, 1921, I was involved in the robbery of a bank messenger. But they have not told you I was also involved in his murder. I am confessing now because... because I can't go on knowing that I helped to murder a man. I have lived with my thoughts for 15 years. I can't live with them any longer. You may have recognized the play by now. It's Crossroads, the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer dramatic hit. Our stars will be Lana Turner and Hollywood's latest discovery, Pierre Aumont. CB, if it's like the sample you just gave us, I'll take a full order. And good night, and good luck to you, Pierre. Thank you very much. Good night. Yeah. Good, good night. night. Good night. Thank good night. You. Don't forget that victory garden. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theatre presents Lana Turner and Pierre Aumont in Crossroads. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> George Raff will soon be seen in the Warner Brothers picture, Background to Danger. Rancho Tone's next picture is the Paramount production, Five Graves to Cairo. Lynn Barry appeared tonight through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studio and will soon be seen in their Technicolor production, Hello, Frisco, Hello. Heard in tonight's play were Norman Field as Warden, Dick Ryan as Feather, and Leo Cleary, Art Gilmore, Mac Gray, Stanley Farrar, Griff Barnett, Charles Seal, Cliff Clark, Crayon Denton, Ken Christie, Eddie Marr, Tyler McVeigh, Boyd Davis, Warren Ash, and Fred Mackay. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in next Monday night to hear Lana Turner and Pierre Aumont in Crossroads. Before the war, three out of four Americans didn't get enough vitamins. With food shortages and rationing, you're more likely than ever to be vitamin deficient. So for extra vitamins, get them. Follow these two simple rules. Rule one, get